Welcome to Presenza. Welcome to this space of women building the future. Welcome home. Today we are with Makoma Le Calacala. And uh, I'm going to introduce you to her. Okay. So Makoma is the director of Earth Life Africa, a civil society, environmental justice, and anti nuclear organization. She has long been active in social movements, tackling issues from gender and women's rights, social, economic, and environmental justice issues. In recent years, Makoma has focused on targeting environmental corruption. Her commitment to climate justice in South Africa has led civil society to win the first South African climate change legal case against the government and the reversal of the nuclear deal by South Africa and the, and the Russian government. For her, her efforts, she received nonetheless than the Goldman Environmental Prize for Africa 2018 award and SAB Environmentalist of the Year 2018 Award. So it's really a pleasure having you with us today, Miss Makoma. And uh, would you like to add anything to introduce yourself briefly? Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I think that's summary of my introduction but I would say that I lead Etlab Africa Johannesburg, which is chapter of Etlab in South Africa, and I lead the Johannesburg branch, uh, women rights activists and um, social justice activists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's start with the questions. I have a few questions for you in this brief encounter, this brief meeting we're having. Um, so the very first question I would like to ask you is which concrete aspects of your activity do you find most important? I would say as um, a woman, and we know that women um, possess that natural instinct to protect their offspring and their environment. And that is what is central to the work that I'm doing so that life can go on. What is the situation, the actual situation in Africa, uh, mm, referred to uh, the anti-nuclear uh, uh, fight? Currently, we have one nuclear, uh, one nuclear power station in, in, in Africa, which is in Quebec, uh, in South Africa, in Cape Town. And um, what we have got in the past few weeks is that there's a radiation leak. A whistleblower had said that there are leaks at the power station. And uh, what we've seen because of the Chinese interest and also the Russian interest, they are proposing to assist in energy security in different African countries. So we had in Zambia, in Zimbabwe, in Kenya, in Egypt, in Nigeria, in Ghana, that um, there's, there's a strong move to build nuclear reactors. And the colleagues in these countries came to us in South Africa and said, what can you do? So what we are doing now, we actually are building a pan-African um, network of uh, anti-nuclear and for renewables, because we feel that that's what we cannot be anti and not propose anything. So we say anti-nuclear for renewable energy. Um, the problem with, in some of the countries is that there's repression. Uh, not that there's no repression in South Africa, it's not of that, it's there, it's COVID. And in other countries, it's openly out there that when you speak out against you know, this kind of plans, then there's repression, people are silenced, and there's so much that's going on that uh, makes people fear to, to question 
this dirty project, particularly because these are brought by the Chinese who've got a bad track, track record of human rights. It's brought also by the Russians who also have a, got a bad track record on human rights. And um, but then the, there is a strong movement out there that is building up that is saying no nuclear. In South Africa, recently we've had the Minister of Energy announcing again, even after we had taken them to court to say, you can't go ahead you know, with procuring or wanting to build nuclear reactors when we are in this kind of situation where we electricity tariffs are very high. So that means if nuclear reactors are being built, people are not going to be able to afford that. And uh, if a child is born today, that means that child would not access or have electricity from the nuclear reactors built maybe in two years, that would be maybe in their lifetime because there's that um, uh, nuclear reactors take too long to build. There's cost overruns also, but uh, there's uh, construction delays that can you know, uh, end up in the lifetimes of a person without even accessing that. So these are some of the issues, but the worst issue um, around why we warning African governments and we're saying you can't do that, especially the South African government is saying, look at Quebec, look at the danger that this poses to us and why on earth would you still want to go there? So this maps of corruption, environmental corruption, and this is what we stand up at using local, our country's legislation and also using international conventions to challenge um, this addiction to building nuclear uh, energy reactors. And But one thing that I must explain is that um, it is said South Africa is one of the leading nuclear medicine um, uh, countries. We're not saying don't manufacture nuclear medicine. You don't need a nuclear energy reactor to manufacture nuclear medicine. So these are the dangers that we have and uh, we're challenging our government on a on a daily basis to say you cannot. And then um, it's the anniversary of Fukushima. And what Fukushima has taught us is that radiation stays there forever and ever. You may be told that no one died from a, a Fukushima accident, but the long-term impacts, you know, you know, the accumulation of radioactivity has killed actually more people and has also impacted negatively on sea life, also had an impacted negatively on the environment around that particular area. So people may not see that today, people may experience that like it's done, uh, like, like we see in Chernobyl and other places that the impact of that may not even be seen in this generation, but may be seen in the next generation with children born with deformities, with um, uh, life no longer springing where the place has been exposed to radioactivity. So the situation now is that let Fukushima, which is recent, teach us a lesson. But we know that there's so many other accidents, there's so many other uh, problems that have cropped up of these nuclear energy reactors that are not being told uh, to citizens of any particular country because we know the nuclear industry is very, very secretive. It's not going to create jobs. It can be a, a transitional uh, energy. And uh, we cannot be lied to, to say it's uh, a climate change neutral you know, technology for this generation. It's not. The nuclear fuel chain um, and also the waste are actually um, the ones that would create something much more than a climate crisis or a climate emergency that we find ourselves in today. And uh, what has motivated and continues to motivate you to engage in your chosen field? Um, in our um, kind of teachings or our cultures and traditions, there's, um, we, we always say Mangwana Otara Tipakabuhaling, loosely translated in English, it says a woman goes to an extent of holding the sharpest edge of a blade with her bare hands. And that's what motivates me 
that is something that I have inherited from those that have been before me and the, the mothers, uh, the sisters, the brothers that have strived so much that there is justice where we live. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, is it connected somehow to the Ubuntu uh, that, for example, Mr. Mandela spoke about? I am because we are this kind of thing, this kind of philosophy that interconnects everybody to each other? Yes, uh, Ubuntu has been the center of what people in Africa, it's called in different names. But in South Africa, we loosely use Ubuntu Boto. And uh, that interconnectedness amongst ourselves as human beings doesn't end there. It's also our interconnectedness with what's around us. Our interconnectedness with the living beings, whether it can be the trees, whether it can be the rivers, whether it can be the beds that we find ourselves living amongst them, we are interconnected to the environment around us. We are interconnected into the future. We are interconnected in what we are. So it doesn't only end into that we live as a collective, we live as a community, but it's much more than that. For an example, in our own um, cultures as clans or as a tribes, we have what we call totems, and much of our totems would be animals or what's around us. If my totem is a bed, that means I must protect those beds. If another person's totem is a cow, that means they must protect them. If another is a crocodile, they must protect them. So we are interconnected in what is around us, and our totems actually instruct us just to make sure that there's protection of life around us or what is around us, because if that become extinct, that means we cannot have life anymore. If you can please describe the future you aspire to. I want to see a future where justice prevails. And um, that future of where justice prevails, that would be a future where we see life around us being sustainable, where we see um, no wars. And I must say, currently, we actually are in a global war. And that global war, it's not COVID-19 only. We have been in a silent global war that um, we have not connected to it. For, for the mere fact that people go to bed hungry, for the mere fact that uh, our waters are poisons, for the mere fact that our air is poisons, that is an onslaught on life on earth. That is an onslaught on the people. So I want to see a future where none of this exists. I want to see a future that um, everybody would have a healthy life and a healthy living. And that's what I'm working for because I don't want my grandchildren to spit on my grave and say, see what you have left for us. So that future, that's what we're working towards. It's not what we see as business as normal. And sometimes I ask myself when people talk about a just recovery from COVID-19, what is that just recovery from COVID-19? And do we want to go back to the norm where people go to bed hungry? Do we want to go to the norm where people's lands are taken? Do we want to go to the norm where we see um, this deliberate means of making our continent a radioactive zone. No, I don't want to see that. And that is why I have dedicated my life deliberately to making sure that that does not exist, particularly that the energy system that we have is decentralized, is that energy system that doesn't cause us not to be able to breathe. The energy system that would not cause us not to have clean water to drink, but the energy system that would actually contribute towards 
a healthy and sustainable livelihood where we don't see centralized kind of energy system where you see other people leaving their families for longer periods and also uh, longer periods and disrupting the family life. I want to see a, a future whereby we don't have to deal with hazardous waste from the energy decisions that we make that we become radioactive for centuries and centuries to come and that would disrupt life on earth. But the future that I want to see is that future where me and you will be able to breathe and live a healthy life and have food abundantly where our soil is not poisonous, where we can be proudly saying we, will, we have our sacred sites, where we can proudly say that we live off the ground, where our spirituality is not kind of disconnected because of the climate that we find ourselves in. Help us understand how can we, as journalists, as activists, how can we help you in your fight? How can Presenza help you? I think the important thing is to um, find a way on how you generate not just national discourse, but just um, a global discourse around the dangers of uh, nuclear energy and why it's important for us or for countries to move away from fossil fuel um, electricity generation towards a low carbon, uh, a low carbon electricity generation. The issue is that um, as, 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 as people, as journalists, I think you have that uh, skill where you can extract from history, link it to the present, and um, maybe ask us about what kind of future do we see based on what we have deducted from history and what is happening. And for the more you write about the stories, the more you, you, you check down people and ask them how do they feel about this, I think it makes much more sense. And this would send a message to those decision makers. If you want to, for an example, build a nuclear reactor next to the Nile River, uh, what do you expect? I mean, the historical significance of the Nile River in Africa, in different religions, and you want to make that water radioactive. I mean, those are some of the connections in your stories that can be made. But also, I think for people like myself, I would want more to get, um, because we've got expertise, you know, to also write about what has been discussed at different international forums, like your United Nations, like your African Union, like your European Union, as to what exactly um, the discussions or discourse around these issues are about. If you write about them, would be able to pick them and would be able to know who to go to or which door to knock so that uh, we can make an impression as to how we feel and what dangers this kind of energy technology would bring to our lives. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope your, your fight will continue as strong as ever. Thank you. And your fight is thank, our fight. Thank you. We all in this together. Absolutely. Thank you very much.